Once upon a time, two friends joined forces to bring you the best in horror entertainment. Brian from the north, Tim from the south, each bringing their own unique perspective to the horror community. Movie reviews, Blu-ray releases, beer pairings, games, and more. Welcome to your new home for horror. This is Civil Gore. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode 248 of the Civil Gore podcast. I am your host, Tim. And this is Brian, and we are nearing the end of the season, and and actually we're closing in towards 250, which is a, um, a little milestone episode there. But that is probably going to be episode uh, our first episode of the new season, because I think next week is going to be our last official episode for the year before we take our usual our winter break. You'll get a dismemberment uh, first week of January, of course, and then we'll probably come back uh, either that first or second week of January. Uh, with with all new episodes, so we'll have another holiday movie for you uh, next week. But this week we're gonna do a a fun holiday movie called Holiday Hell. Yeah, so this one's on Tubi, so you can watch it for yourself if you. Yep. And interested. if you don't have Tubi for some reason, I don't know why you wouldn't. It's free. There's also Freevee, which is, <laughs> uh, but that's Amazon. Uh, you need to have an Amazon account for that. So it's Freevee to a point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you still need an Amazon account. So I, I'm not sure how that kind of works, but. Um, yeah, but Tubi is the better thing. Um, Tubi is kind of funny, though. I have to say, it just cracks me up sometimes, their choice of where they put the ads. Like, I'm all for ads if it's going to be – if I'm getting a free service and that many options to watch. Like, Tubi, I really could say there's no complaints. It's more, like, comical where they put the commercials. Like, literally mid-sentence sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> it's they, funny. they really don't care. And, then, and the thing I like about Tubi's ads is they're not so abundant that it just – makes you want to quit the movie like plex plex yeah, i that's hate a lot. their ad because what they do is they start you off with one ad and then the next time they break it's two ads and then the next yeah. time they break and they keep increasing the ads as you go through the movie so that by the end of the movie you're literally watching like 12 ads in a row it's yeah. so obnoxious yeah it's like longer than the movie by the end i mean of this, i would plex is my absolute last resort if i have to watch a movie and that's the only place i can get it yeah, and if you notice, most of the time, if it's on Plex, it's on something else, too. You just got to dig a little sometimes. Yeah, it's yeah. usually usually somewhere. But, yeah, no, Tubi and, – and Tim and I were kind of joking about this uh, last week was that uh, – with Tubi, sometimes you don't even find stuff until you click on something else. Like if you go through their holiday movies, let's say, and then you pick Holiday Hell for a for, uh you know, for an option. If you look then at other things they suggest, it's movies that you weren't seeing before. It's a really weird algorithm they have there. It's like I think they they must do something where they put out the things they think would attract the most attention. And then once they get you, then they figure, well, here, you might like these too. Yeah, there is kind something weird going on there. Cause yeah, not, but it's probably a strategy. Library. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's a, 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 you know, a planned strategy. I'm sure it's makes sense at some level if you think about it because – you know, you're going to want to attract everybody. You know, you're going to want to attract the people to your your movie, right? But then when you you know you have them and you know kind of what they like there, it's an easy way to get some uh, curating thing without probably extra programming of putting it in the main thing. I've I noticed mean, I Voodoo know. does that too with their uh, like their sales. If you look at a Voodoo sale and you click on it, it appears to me, this is an assumption I'm making just based on my observation, it appears to me that they put the best sellers first. And they're they're ranking them in order of like popularity, because mm. if you look at the beginning of the sale, it'll be like all the big movies you instantly recognize. If you scroll all the way to the end of the sale, it's like stuff you've never heard of. So I'm sure there's something there as well that they're doing some kind of sorting algorithm to to put to push the more popular, more sold movies to the top. Yeah, hey, you know, you know what? That'd be a fun interview. I would love actually. To have an interview with someone who curates and plans a streaming site, like one of the tech people in there, yeah, you know, and see what kind of instruction they get. Do they just get a free for all? Oh, I read a uh, article about how Spotify does their algorithms, and it was fascinating. And it's so much more complex than I thought. But they they do different things. Like obviously, the easy stuff, the top level is you know songs that you liked. You know, they're obviously going to play. But they also do things where they look at the time you listen to a song and whether you skipped it. So if you listen to a song for less than 30 seconds and skipped it, that weights, that lowers its weight in the algorithm because mm. they think, oh, well, you must not like this song. And then a song that you may necessarily, not necessarily like, but you listen to it like 
almost all the way through, then that weight weights it higher. And then and it gets way more complex than that. But that's just one of the little things I was reading about that was really it was it was like a I swear to God, it was like a twenty page long paper on Spotify wow. algorithm. I couldn't even understand the math involved. It was like getting that kind of ca- makes sense. I get yeah. it. You know, I get. You but know, that one it was so cool. It, it, I found that fascinating. But uh, anyway, let's get to our. This is probably going to be a very small first chunk. <laughs> All right, Brian. Well, I did. I didn't watch any horror. I've been so busy this week, and, and apologies to the listeners for uh, for this late episode. But there was a reason for it. It's because uh, Brian and I were both re- really crazy busy this week. Uh, me with work. As well as uh, we had a big party planned uh, Saturday. We had an ornament exchange. And it was the first big party we ever hosted at our new house. So we were a little uh, trepidatious about how it would go. Because mm-hmm. we have a new dog in the mix. We didn't know how she was going to react to all these people. And then the people we invited. It was one of those parties where it was a bunch of different friends that don't know each other. Uh. So, you know, we had... Olivia's co-workers and then we had like friends of the family but then we also had family and then we also had like uh like one of Anna's uh friend's parents and then we had like other like people that were friends of Joshua's friend's parents kind of thing so it was like a whole like <laughs> so it was like you took all these different people that we knew and just stuck them all in one room I feel like you were about to burst into like these are the people in your neighborhood. <laughs> sort of like that. Yeah. Which which R.I.P. of course about the, the oh, great gosh. Bob McGrath, oh, that was which sad. was very sad yeah. to hear because Tim and I growing up on Sesame Street, whenever the you know the the the, the mainstays from from that our generation. And Bob was Sesame one of my Street absolute lost. favorites. Oh, and he was the best. Yeah. I mean, he's some of those songs you find yourself like humming is, is like him. Yeah. So yeah, but it's a, so I was a little scared. I was like, oh god, we're gonna have all these random people, and then we're gonna have this dog. And I'm telling you, it turned out awesome. It went perfectly. We had this absolute amazing spread of food that Olivia made. Uh, I helped actually with some of the food, so I'm, I'm taking a little partial credit on that- it. Uh, and then we had people bring stuff. And then we had, uh, I made some a whole pitcher of cranberry margaritas that were a big hit. We had... Uh, but wait, how did people drink it if you just made a pitcher of it? <laughs> it, it was a big, joke, it was a big pitcher. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, we had, uh, oh my gosh, so then we had the ornament exchange. And we do the ornament exchange where uh, it's sort of like the white elephant gift type thing, but uh, everybody okay. brings a nice ornament that's wrapped. We put it on the table, and then everybody draws a number. And then when you when your number is called, you can either open a gift from the table, which you don't know what it's going to be, or you can steal an ornament that you really like from somebody else that's already been opened. And it gets really cutthroat towards the end because there's like there's always some ornament that everybody wants to have and in this case it was a seahorse my mom brought it was this glass blown seahorse and for some inexplicable reason it had these giant lips so we just so we started calling it lips and then so now everybody in the room was fighting over lips (laughs) <laughs> and it was getting oh, stolen okay. back and forth, and it was we were just dying laughing. It was really funny. See, I I, I can't handle those things. Like I, I like I did a cup once, and I, I like always feel guilty. I never want to take anything from someone else, and you know. And so then I, I usually just always grab something, and then and that's the end. You know. So it's like I I, I don't know. Just the, my anxiety level ramps up with we, those. It was things. funny that we had some people that were like that. They were like they were too nice to steal from somebody. I'm like, no, that's not the point. You have to be cutthroat. I've been playing this game for years. I know I can't do it. I can't cutthroat with things like that. Like and, and you know, it's like I almost feel like I want to like like going if like for that one, which is like easier to do this trick. I'm like I'm trying to like I always like to to, to you know like to steal a uh, term from Becca Scott like game the game kind of thing. I want to like like since I knew this in ornament sta- exchange. I feel like I should almost like take like have an another ornament like in my pocket and kind of just kind of put it out there <laughs> like if I, and like hold it and look like I've gone already and then just end it. Me and Olivia used to game game it where if she if I knew she wanted an ornament and this is great for couples so if she wanted an ornament and I wanted an ornament we would work together to try uh. to get that ornament for each other because it's going home with us either way right so we would kind of and then there's another strategy in terms of. We played where if the ornament was stolen twice, it's quote unquote dead for that round. You can't steal it a third uh. time. Uh, usually we play three times, but we had such a big crowd, we needed to shorten the game a little bit. So two times you steal it and it's dead. So you could strategize by stealing a gift that had already been stolen so that it's dead on your turn. 
And then at least you have a chance of holding on to it because so nobody can steal it back from you at least that round. So I don't know. I I came away. I did I did terrible. Even though I hosted the ornament exchange, I did terrible this round. I got two ornaments I really didn't want, and yeah. uh, and Olivia wound up inexplicably with nothing because she gave she gave her her number to Anna, and then Anna and that, that could happen. You could end up with nothing. Well, you, not supposedly not, but apparently Olivia decided not to play and gave it to Anna, and then Anna ended up giving her gift her ornament away. I think so. I don't know. Long story short, we brought four ornaments to the ornament exchange. We came out with two somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you you somehow managed to like be like I, the ultimate I some, loss. In I that somehow one, lost guess. two ornaments in this whole thing, and they were and then the two ornaments two ornaments I got I didn't even want. So it was, but we had a blast. Everybody like it was so weird seeing like all these people that we knew from different areas all talking and mingling together and like hitting it off, which was awesome but i i didn't expect that because you never know like like you don't expect like work friends to mingle with like kids parents friends but somehow everybody yeah. got along and uh we uh it, we, like when we ended the night they were like we're doing this next year like absolutely we're doing this next year so that- we got we already got we already got plans for next year so anyway uh mia was good as gold i mean Aww. she was awesome she she behaved herself. She didn't beg. She ran around. You know, she socialized with people, but she didn't jump on anybody. You know, she just see. That's where I would have thought you would have trained her to like steal the good ornaments. I like, know. Well, intimidate. Well, the, I've got the, a whole year people. to work on that, though. I'm, yeah, you need to train her like to growl at the person that <laughs> goes to steal the ornament. Yeah. But I don't know. just the ornament, though. You know, just not not like growl in normal ways. You know? But it was it was a blast. And then you know, Christmas wise, I'm like, wait, it's it's a week. You know, I have these. I have on years and I have off years. Last year was an off year where I feel like I'm, it's sneaking up on me. I'm not prepared. You know, I'm not in the spirit. And like this year I had the, I had the decorations up. I had the tree up early. I've got, I've literally got all the, all of Olivia's gifts are done and wrapped under the tree. All of the kids stuff is done. So I'm like, like there's literally almost nothing left for me to do. And it's only December 12th. So I'm like freaking out because this is like, this is like one of the best years I've had in a while. Yeah, no, and t- Tim's not letting me forget it either because the other day he came up, you know, he told me, he says, I got Joshua's Turbo Man nestled safely under our tree. <laughs> that's, that's, that's one of my favorite Phil Hartman lines in that movie, sorry. And the only um, thing I'm really behind on is watching Christmas movies. I really have not said, I've still got, still got plenty of time, but I haven't watched Christmas oh, yeah. Vacation. I haven't watched the original Christmas Story. I haven't watched... It's a Wonderful Life. I haven't watched Ernest Saves Christmas. I, I got a ton to catch up there. Yeah, I know. Same here. I, I need to like just like start popping them on in the background of things. Yeah. You know? Well, usually when I when I you know when I work from home uh, work, I usually put my iPad on and have stuff going on like that. Those are the things they can just put on in the background. Yeah, because you've seen them a billion it. times. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I had a, I, I mean, I just been like, yeah, crazy with the busy, just with like the things to do. Um, but we did get to see the, uh, Cone uh, came, uh, to visit. He hasn't actually been to our apartment ever since, uh, the whole time. Cause we usually go to them, but, uh, or meet somewhere, but this is the first time he was able to come here. He got to meet Obi. And, uh, so that was good. He and learned of course, that Obi, Obi was real. Yes. He learned Obi was real. And he, <laughs> you know, of course he like Obi loved them. Uh, it, it was just, uh, uh it was just uh, Steve, Nicole, and Sophia, which is a uh, uh, ne- their youngest daughter. Um, uh, Zan- I think uh, Isabel was uh, off somewhere. She she's got a million activities, so I think she was somewhere else. And then I think Xander was uh, he's older. He's in college, so he was with his friends. But um, but uh, I'll tell you though, it was it was fun because, and I'm not gonna give any kind of pl- uh, of these these stories away. But like. Steve and Nicole have a prodigy on their hand for horror writing with and horror art stuff with with their daughter Sophia. I, I like I'll, I'll I don't want to say it on air because I don't want someone to go steal it. There was one she came up with that was so like it like blew my mind how like impressive the the idea was, and you know and she's like not even into high school yet. Yeah, you know? and she's got like all these short stories, and and like, it's crazy. It's like yeah, got, we'll have to we'll have to tell you next time we all chat with Cone and stuff. He'll have to bring he'll tell you some of that. Well, I've I seen mean, her yeah. artwork is amazing. Yeah, I even told her I said she should uh, start doing that. Uh, give us some ideas for the new Civil Gore logo too. So mm-hmm. I think Cone's gonna have her work on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was fun. So we watched uh, 
you know, but when we were there, you know, we were, we, you know, we caught up, had some food, some drinks. Um, and, um, what, but one of the things is, uh, she wanted us to watch because she's obsessed with the cabinet of curiosity. So she wanted us to watch. So we watched the first three episodes and, you know, I, I definitely love the, the whole dynamic of it. it's very, very creep show esque, a lot of it, you know, stuff like that, but that's not a bad thing. You know, that's what I love. I love those kind of things. It's like a, a, a great, great anthology, um, series i think so uh, my favorites i think the rat one was my favorite so far yeah i love that one and they're all good at some level i've yeah. i finished the whole series and they're freaking amazing yeah and the f murray abraham one was actually pretty cool too that yeah. was a really good one and that's where we, we only got the first three i'm gonna i'll probably watch the rest uh throughout the next week though yeah they're they're all good and, and they all have some level because of course of del toro's involvement they all have some kind of like monster creature angle to them so and there's uh two lovecraft episodes i think oh. at least two lovecraft episodes that are directly based off lovecraft works i mean they're they're really really it's almost like if you took and i don't want to disparage creep show because i really like that series as well but if you took creep show and gave it a bigger budget and you put like big some bigger name directors behind it you get like some really eh, it's it's very it feels very curated to me. If it, none of these feel like, I mean, usually these anthology series you have some duds, and I just yeah. I didn't feel like any of these were duds. Well, I mean, this was in works for a while now, right? I mean, yeah. we knew about this I think like two years ago. Yeah. So you know, and I mean, granted, probably the pandemic pushed stuff back, but still, I mean, they had a lot of time to work on this. They had a lot of time to make sure this thing was was up to par, and it, it really even exceeded it. I think so. Yeah, it was uh, it was good though. Yeah, so we have a good uh, fun time with with good old Cone and family. Um, and that that's really. But then you know, then Julie and I had some errands on Saturday to do, and so it's just we've been moving all over the place. Oh, and I posted. Um, you probably saw some of those really cool stickers from uh, our friends. Uh, from uh, you know that she works at Elise's nieces. She has that Jess. I mentioned on the show the Jess Lask designs. Um. All those cool stickers and that little cool tic tac toe thing. Did you see that when yeah, I posted that? Yeah, I saw That's it. a neat little thing. She's got two versions of that where it's like spooky tic tac toe. It's so cool. And, you know, she has like, you know, themed uh, things. These stickers are great for anything like water bottles, you know, put it on laptops, put it on gifts, you know. She's got it. So definitely check out her. Uh, it's at Jess Lask Designs. Yeah, you can go look at um, on uh, our Instagram where I posted that and you can get uh, go to her her Etsy page from there It'll, uh, you know go to her site and then go to Etsy page uh, some really great stuff and uh, one more piece of business we'll just um, read this here so smile bring home smile on 4k UHD disc today Sosie Bacon stars in this terrifying horror movie which critics are calling haunting and scary as hell face your fears with over an hour of heart Pounding bonus content, including Laura Hasn't Slept, the nail-biting original short film that has started it all, plus deleted scenes and more, available on 4K and Blu-ray, rated R from Paramount Pictures. And not only that, but as you're listening to this, keep an eye on our social media, all three of them, Facebook, uh, well, three big ones, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, because we will be doing another contest to give away... I believe we have five Blu-rays uh, to give away this time. We gave away the digital copies, but this one we're going to have uh, five Blu-rays this time to give away for Smile. So keep an eye on that uh, contest. It'll probably be very similar uh, where, you know, you have to like the tweet and reply with uh, some kind of answer. Uh, we've we've had a lot of fun. It seems like everyone seems to have fun with those lately. Yeah, those are, the last ones we've run have been really popular. And fun fact, Sosie Bacon is only one degree from Kevin Bacon. Yes, easily. Literally. And, and, and one degree from a BLT sandwich. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, actually, she she's fun. Uh, you got to follow her on Instagram. Uh, well, we I mean, we do, but like uh, meant listeners follow her. She has the funniest stuff on there. Like she had this thing, I guess, when she filmed something in uh, out of the country and whatever, uh, wherever she was, she she said they learned the snacks where she takes like a bag of chips, uh, pours in like a ton of hot sauce, shakes up the chips. So it basically gets the chips drenched in hot sauce and a little soggy, and then she goes in with chopsticks and eats it out of the bag. She said wherever she was, that's they ate that constantly like that. Oh, my god! And I'm looking at it, I said, what a cool idea. Because it's basically like you're eating, like, a potatoes just, yeah. like, with some hot spicy sauce. And I like to put hot sauce on everything, so I'm, like, all about that. I got to – Well, speaking of the bacons, if you have not watched Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, run out and do that. It is phenomenal. 
Yeah, I just I gotta wait. I promised Julie I'd wait on that yeah. one. Yeah, so well, yeah, it's so worth gonna... it's worth waiting on. I'm gonna have to watch it again with uh, with Olivia because it, it was fantastic. But anyway, so that brings us to our main feature, Holiday Hill from 2019. I had I had not heard of this one until Brian brought it up. Yeah, this was a to be discovery when I just was looking <laughs> through holiday horror, and uh, this one popped up and. But what I mean now, granted, I looked at the plot. I'm like, okay, it's a it's a horror movie around Christmas time. It's an anthology. Already two points there. But what what sealed the deal is that it had Jeffrey Combs, and that to me, I will watch that guy in anything. <laughs> yes, and he's easily the best part of this movie. Oh my god, he, yeah. And this with this, I will say a spoiler alert here: the wraparound segment is the strongest yes. thing about this movie, yeah. which you usually don't hear from an anthology. Largely in part to Jeffrey Combs. I mean, he, he yeah. just knocks it out of the park with his character, the shop. Well, actually, and I, I like the one the one that played Amelia, her Megan Karimi Nazer. Uh, she's she actually really good, too. too. Yeah. It was a great, yeah, great back and forth they had. I mean, you really kind of felt like they, like he played, he like, I mean, he played the eccentric shopkeeper to a T. He had that cool striped suit, just that, like the, the whimsy, the typical Jeffrey Combs. Yeah. Like, like. Like all out, his characters all always have kind some of kind of quirkiness to them. Yeah, and, and he was like, like I, I mean, the second you walk in, you see this, you're like, okay, that's a store I want to go into. You know? Yeah. I mean, uh, and you know, and she was really good as this, like, kind of like this uh, last minute shopper needing to find the perfect oddball gift kind of thing. I feel like you know what it kind of reminded me of is when you you and. Uh, when we were in New York City and we found that weird shop. I thought of the same you're try- exact thing. Right? And you were trying to find something yes, for Kevin. <laughs> I was looking for something for Kevin and there was a – dude, this reminded me of that store so much. There was a store Right? In New Didn't York it? City. Like right away. I'm like, oh my and god, they, Tim. I bet you Tim sees this. Yes. They sold, <laughs> uh, they sold like skeletons and like things in jars and anatomical blueprints. It was – it was this store is like a little more on the weird side. I've seen um, – I don't remember which uh, – reality show this was there was a reality show that took place in a store just like this uh and i don't remember the name of it it was something that ran at some probably on discovery or something but it was about people coming into the shop and it was like it was the same stuff taxidermy and old autopsy kits and vampire hunting kits and all the kind yeah. of weird stuff you would see dummies and ventriloquist dummies and all kinds of stuff like that so that's what i really like the wraparound i was instantly hooked with this wraparound because i'm like i love right. this store it looks really cool and then kind of the brilliant wraparound that every object not not that that hasn't been done before right but every object in this store has a story and then yeah it goes i like story. Th- didn't that give you like this like warm feeling almost like that is like this kind of like ah that's what I love yeah. that's an, that's what an anthology is like that's like I mean it's textbook anthology but the fact is that with Jeffrey Combs the way he delivers it yeah you like ah I like I would I like Tim and I walked into the store we'd be there for twelve hours yeah. listening to him on every object to tell a story now kind of thing. I will say this movie definitely a little more on the low budget side not gonna yeah. lie it's a little more on the low budget side so the acting and stuff you, you kind of Go in with the expectation that, you know, the acting outside of, uh, you know, Jeffrey Combs and and in the... Well, record. actually, Joel Murray was really good. Joel Murray was really uh, good. He, uh, he was. Yeah, one of the Murray boys. Yeah, but there. He was great you know, in his you're, segment. You're, you're getting a more of a low-budget indie feel to the movie, which I'm not disparaging because I really enjoyed it. But uh, just going that with, you know, with an open mind there. And uh, I think they did a great job of picking which stories to go in what order because i thought yeah. every story was better than the one before it and then the wraparound being the last entry technically in the whole movie yeah. was the strongest so right. I, it was it was nice to see an anthology that knew how to pace its stories and put the weaker ones up front and and there's only four stories so it, yeah. it was readily apparent you know which ones well let's just go through them i don't give like super spoilers for these but i'll give yeah, you an yeah. idea of of what they are i don't know that they had any kind of official title but the you know i saw an article that did give them names yeah but um, i think we'll just have but to describe I, don't know, I don't know if that like i'm not gonna be i i don't want to say like that's you know that that's definitive or not that could have just been something they dug up i guess uh should we do i mean you know what it's weird for the uh you know what i put the director in i messed it up i realized on the rundown i put the director there and then i over wrote it 
apparently with the uh with the cast here for the the housekeeping so it's, it's sorry jeremy berg david burns jeff farrell and jeff vigil there was two jeffs i think is what threw me off i looked at it quite quick so yeah there are four directors for each segment uh not sure who did the wraparound one but um probably i would say if i had to guess it'd probably be the one that did the last the last uh actual the last story yeah the fourth one would probably do the wraparound because they um not not to you know I, I won't say why. I just that's why I think that. But the uh, style was similar. But um, and so yeah, I don't know if we really need to re- read the cast either. I mean, past Jeffrey Combs is like the big one. So yeah, we I'll read the couple ones we didn't mention. Jeffrey Arrington as Robert, Lisa Carswell as Lavinia. We mentioned Joe Murray as Chris, McKenna Ralston as Anna, and we mentioned uh, Megan Creamy Nazer as Amelia, and then of course Jeffrey Combs. So the first segment is uh, about a mask. Looks like kind of like one of those. Um, what do you call those masks? You see them at hobby stores all the time. It's almost well, yeah. It's like one of those masquerade masquerade kind of things hang or, on the wall. You see them on hanging like on walls, ba- but it's like a masquerade with like a baby doll. Yeah, like, kind of like mix. So it, it, there's there's a story about this this mask and uh, a girl that wears it and and what happens to these people in a house. Th- this one to me seemed the most low budgety of all the segments. Yeah, like the most they spent on probably for this one was the old lanterns that they had in the house. <laughs> exactly. Because basically, yeah, they break in this house and there's no electricity or running water, so they just have lanterns literally all it, over it the house. It kind of looks like they just used somebody's house that, that that was part of the cast or something. And so this one's kind of, to me, this one was kind of the weakest. It was a very standard people caught in a house with a killer type thing. Yeah, and like you know, they where they think it's like, oh, the crazy person lived here. They own the house, but it's been abandoned for three days. I mean, it's like I'm like, I mean, this unfortunately, this one you could see everything. That's it's a mile away. Yeah, what's, what's coming? I mean, this is not even like a. Uh, it's not like there's there's no suspense in this one. It's I mean, I hate to say it, it's not even creepy at all. It, like they could have made it creepy with that mask, and they didn't. And there was, I mean, I like the fact that they had a deaf girl uh, in there that I thought deaf protagonist was kind of cool but yeah that was kind of neat I, although there was one scene where and this is just a nitpick because i you know uh it, but there's one point where someone is like totally talking to her and he turns away and still talking to her and she answers him like through <laughs> sign language i'm like okay you turned away she's deaf so she couldn't possibly even read all your lips for the what you said so i mean it's little things like that i think it was just you know what the best way to describe this is careless there was just a little careless things yeah, in it that there made was it. there was like weird like reactions there was like a character does something in here that's like would be really traumatic i would say and yeah. the like two seconds after they do this which doesn't seem like they would something they would do anyway but two seconds after they do this they're like perfectly normal and then, like, I can't, I'm trying to dance around spoilers here, but, like, yeah. the person who should be most affected by this event just seems to, like, shrug it off within, like, five seconds. And it, just, it made no sense to me. I was like, this, this, like, none of this adds up. Like, the, the, the reactions here are just so, like you said, careless. Like, it's like they didn't yeah. even think about, you know, making this I- even somewhat realistic about how people would react to this. So, this one was definitely my least favorite of the whole movie. Yeah, I mean, they could have made this so creepy. Yeah. Like, they had all the lanterns on there and say how there was no running water and no full electricity. Yet, like, so, like, the lantern should have ran out of battery, make it darker. But they couldn't because that, all honesty, because of its, I think, low budget nature, those lanterns were probably literally their lighting system yeah. for this. <laughs> yes, sir. And, and I'm not trying to make fun of it. Yeah. I'm not trying to bash it because I, that's not what it is. I still enjoyed the segment at some level and the movie as a whole i'm just saying i'm like you know what like there's there's th- there's choices i would have made and they may not have been able to make them due to the budget of it and so i oh, you know, I, it's hard we to, must say this one departed from the whole this is holiday hill so it's, it's four different holidays this one was um valentine's day very loose. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But you know what? Technically, that right. That wasn't a Christmas one. The rest were though. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. This was. This was a. Well, not Christmas, but around this time. Yeah. Year, yeah. So like... this was the only one that kind of departed. But uh, you, you, that was. I think they mentioned that in the dialogue. There's no nothing you would know about the whole segment that would make it seem like it was on Valentine's Day. Other than yeah, and they said one line. Yeah. yeah they they did that in the last one too. You wouldn't know that's around Christmas until. 
there was like the the throwaway line of, "Well, we don't really decorate around this town or something." Yeah. So it's like, yeah, they, there's there's it's weird the way they like the all the wraparound is what holds it together as a Christmas horror movie. I think because you know she's out there to try. It's the day before Christmas Eve. Is, yeah the setting of it so so at some level that's all you really need to make this a holiday horror film because remember just because he's telling a story about a different time it's still about a, a potential christmas gift yeah the uh so it works it works in a, that way the second one was a, was a your basic the hanukkah one. it was a hanukkah one. how great was that it was they, your... they, uh, they found a way to get a uh, to represent the ka i love it it was your basic uh evil doll segment yeah. um which you know, trilogy of terror vibes in there a little a little bit, you know? a lot of puppet master vibes the way they filmed yeah, lots of the doll master. looked very puppet mastery so yeah uh yeah so that would i mean it was okay i i i like all evil doll things uh, on some level yeah but again extremely predictable yeah you knew ex- i mean from the second this thing started you already you know and they announced Okay, well, we gave this, you know, this here's this creepy doll, you know, they, they got this doll. It's a rare, one of a kind doll, for so and so. And then now the parents are going out of town, and the babysitter's there. Now, if you couldn't tell that that babysitter was in danger, <laughs> and then you'd know in about five more seconds when she becomes an evil babysitter, yeah. you know, and she's well, like, how many nasty, times have we so seen like, that? I mean, you're like, okay, this is then I, this is not even going to be like, you know, what's going to happen? Still. It was kind of fun because I like one. I, I, thank God they rep. You know, other than Death Sember, I don't. You don't see many like, uh, uh, like holiday anthologies that feature Hanukkah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that was a plus. And then two, you know, you get a creepy doll thing like Tim. Yeah. Tim and I are big creepy, like creepy doll, doll fans. Things. I can't yeah. help it. Yeah. You know what? We like what we like. <laughs> so I liked it on that level. It, it was you know creep good. I don't think there's anything such thing as a bad creepy doll thing. I think all of them are enjoyable at some level. Oh yeah, yeah, because it's it's you know it's like you know it's one of those things where it's like okay it's it's you know you're as a child you sit there you wish your dolls would come to life so it's good they can basically play on a a wish these doll movies but that that, that you know one of those be careful what you wish for it's another and one of those so that like uh, this whole this whole uh, anthology is strange not strange I, I I actually don't mind it but the holiday affiliations are very loose. Except for this next segment we're going to talk about. But. Well, this one, I mean, remember, it was the eighth night of Hanukkah. So it's he, they flat out say this is, you know, like, oh. You, but other like, than that, yeah, like, yeah. You, I'm just saying you could take this and and not make it a Hanukkah doll and, and it would be the same story. Like, there's no, there's nothing that completely ties it. Oh, right. To yes. I, I, yeah. Other than the, the happens this to take next place. One. Yeah. And this next one actually was my favorite. It was my out favorite. Out of the four yes. segments. It was my favorite, too. And I'll, I'll have to say when we were talking about them getting stronger. Uh, I might make an exception here because I think this one might actually be stronger than the fourth one. I agree. I was gonna I was gonna mention yeah. that as we got to this. I said just because I, this one just had like this. Uh, this one had a very. This is very creep show esque to me. Very. This, this one. is so easy. And tales comics. from the crypt. Oh and this God. is like yes. right to those type of things. So if you love those kind of, this one is like the perfect and it, thing. And for it you. went in a way I didn't quite expect, which was. Kind of a right, refreshing yeah, change like, from the rest of these. So you have uh, Joel Murray plays Chris. Joel Murray is, of course, the younger brother of Bill Murray. who's He's great in this, by the he way. He's so good at it. He is this um, kind of a sad sack husband. He's got this really uh, na- na- kind of nasty wife, which, for better or for worse, the EC Comics often did this, where, yeah. where the wife was a shrew and a very, very EC comic. A, yeah, a henpecked husband. I'm sure that wouldn't fly today. Uh, so yeah. much, but um, just take it for what it is. It's it's, it's one of those EC comic traditions, and uh, she's um, he gets passed over for promotion at work because he really didn't fight for it. His, his wife he won't even sleep with him. She's um, you know, you can tell she's kind of just disgusted with him. He's just the sad set guy, and uh, apparently he he played Santa Claus at the at the company Christmas party, and the the previous year he had gotten drunk and and made a fool of himself and. So there, there's a lot of a uh, another of, thing, another typical EC that you know that recovering alcohol, recovering like, alcohol. hasn't touched a drink yeah. in a year, kind of thing. Yeah, but so. I love this one because it really took its time. This, I believe this was the longest segment. I think so. Yeah, and it really took its time to to really develop the characters in a way that none of the other segments really did. And and I loved that they just took their time with it. I mean, you really start feeling there's a little bit of sympathy for. 
Chris, but you're also a little bit of kind of uh, disdain for him as well. It's kind of a weird balancing act to uh, yeah. To, you know, it's like you're root, you're rooting for him at some level always, but you're also like Ugh. this dude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's and anyway, I, we won't tell you what happens, but uh, it does involve a Santa suit, and of course, some horror uh, ensues. And I thought it was just great how everything escalated, and it went it went in a direction. I I thought this was going to be your typical killer Santa thing that you've yeah. seen from tales from the crypt you know and everybody that story you never, and i thought they put a nice little twist on it yeah and, and you know and that's not so much a spoiler because basically the way they uh the way they show this uh uh thing is you know it's like they introduce the you know uh jeffrey combs introduces the object right and then says this goes into the story goes into the style and they literally show a bloody santa suit she discovers yeah, in the so shop. you know so you him. already know okay something's going wrong with this santa element you know it's like and once you know he's saying you know you can see it develop but even so it goes in a different way than you'd think and i and joel murray i think was like i think if there was not if someone else doing that not as good this segment may not have been my favorite, but I think he sold on it. He sold it so well, and he was so good at that character. Yeah, and it was like just it was it was, it was so bizarre, and it had it was comedic at parts, and it was just you know, definitely the, the that was like the perfect almost anthology segment. It felt kind of thing. so like like you said earlier, warm and familiar because it it just it had that feel of Tales from the Crypt, it had that feel of Creep Show, had that feel of twilight zone i mean it just yeah. really nailed that whole anthology like the best anthology story feeling so I, yeah. I this was by far yeah i agree by far my favorite segment the next one up was this one i almost, literally almost forgot about this one um, yeah. because it so closely ties into the wraparound right it almost blends, it almost in, blends it. in and that's why i kind of like because Skipped they over. flip it. Remember, she tells him the story yeah. now. So that's that's what was a kind of a unique thing right there. Yeah, she so Jeffrey cool. Combs notices a ring that she has on and he asks her about the ring and then she tells him a story about this ring. And this was this segment's fine. Um and it, again, like it ties so closely to the wraparound, it's a very important segment to understand yeah. what's going on in the bigger picture. This one was okay. Uh I, I like I mean, I feel like it was it's been done before this exact this exact type of plot, and, and that's probably the though. biggest flaw with this whole movie. I think all of it's been done before. I mean, yeah, all, none true. of these <laughs> stories are very original. I mean, all, I've seen right. variations of all of these in in the old EC comics, and maybe that's what they're going for. I mean, it's fine if you want to do an homage to that style of story. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, these anthology series have been doing that forever. Uh, but I think that's probably the biggest flaw of the movie. Is that none of these were a lot of these stories are very predictable. I mean, even the even the previous one we just talked about, which was our favorite, the Santa Claus one, is predictable on some level. But it was just, oh, yeah. it was just, just implement- not the way it went. Yeah, yeah, it was just implemented well enough that you didn't mind it. Whereas so these other ones, you're kind of like rolling your eyes, going, "Okay, hurry up, get to the part where this 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 happens," because I know that's what's going to yeah. happen. I think. But um, yeah, this one was this one was okay. I, I this yeah, this is definitely the exception to my rule that they got better as time goes on. And but I, I don't understand why they put it here. They had they to. Had to. Yeah. they had to for the wraparound, and you'll see when it makes sense because it goes right into the wraparound. Right. Uh, yeah. So it, it like it. Yeah. There's no way they could have like I think if they had their their choice that they would have probably put like in, in the in, in normal anthology rules that Santa Claus one would have been the final one. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. But they couldn't do it yep. based on, and you'll see why. We're not going to spoil it. But basically, this one is a, the, the simple plot of this one is a, a, a young girl who uh, just lost her mom, uh, you know, rents a room in this farmhouse in this weird town. And, you know, she notices basically that, that uh, people are, you know, just odd. And, they, you know, it's around Christmas time, but they're not celebrating. And there's just. You know, and she just notices some weird things, and and soon enough you can kind of pick up what's gonna go. I'm not gonna say it, but as you're watching it, you can pick up pretty easily. You know, something's heading the wrong way for here. But yeah. uh, and I thought the lead actress to that was pretty good. I, I did I like her. Was, I really liked her. Yes. Yeah. yeah I agree. Um, she was probably the best part of that whole that whole segment. So uh, and then we get to the final wraparound where everything kind of comes to a conclusion. I have to stay way away from spoilers for this because uh, yeah. you could spoil this one pretty bad. Uh, and I don't want to because I think the uh, the entire wraparound was my favorite part of the whole movie. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll definitely. I'll leave that one alone. But uh, it it comes to a satisfying conclusion, and you know, again, 
I give this one a cautious recommendation. If you don't mind yeah. the low budget, if you don't, if you go in knowing that yes, these stories are a little predictable, you know, just kind of go. I still, it, I still found it very entertaining. Like, I was never bored during this movie. Yeah, no, it's not boring. You know, it's an hour and a half, so it it's not not a lot of time investment. It's you know, it's you know, you're looking for some holiday horror thing. Like I know Jeff Whitmire's doing that advent calendar challenge thing he's doing. You know, if you're looking for a holiday horror movie that you might not have seen, this is definitely worth your time. Yeah. And- is it the best one out there? No. no. I mean, but you know, I mean, like, I mean, you want to look at like a one that's like a high, like a bigger budget version of a you know a holiday anthology. You know, you look at this December, you look at a Christmas horror story, you know, you look at those kind of yeah. things. That's going to be there, but this one still does a good job of providing you with a nice holiday themed anthology. And frankly, anything with Jeff, uh, Je- I almost said Jeffrey Jones, oh. Jeffrey Combs. Um, as far as you can never go. If you're a Jeffrey Combs fan, I would say this is almost required viewing because it, yes, his role is. is that good in this. He's really yeah, that he's good. so good. It's so perfect in it. I mean, I think the one thing they they needed for him is he needed like a little stopwatch in his pocket, but that was about it. Yeah, he was like you know he had that like he had the perfect like like. Like he knew how exactly how to sell this guy, ca- his character in this. Yeah. He knew exactly what people, his fans wanted to see out of this character from him. And that's just, that's always him though. I yeah. think he always <laughs> just like a, I mean, the guy's like a legend. You know, so, so anyway, yeah, you could definitely do worse. Throw it, you know, it's free. Throw it on your, throw it on your list. It's an hour and a half. I, I would, I'd give it again. Cautious recommendation and a, and a full recommendation for Jeffrey Combs character. Yes. <laughs> he was awesome. He always gets Full full combs ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Brian, what did you have for the beer pairing for Holiday Hill? So I got I just it's a pretty basic one here, but it's it's you know it's it's a, like it's a holiday themed movie. So I just found the New Belgium Holiday Ale from this year, and that is uh, of course there's two main locations to that brewery: uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, and Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, this one is seven point five percent, and uh, here's the. Uh, the uh, little description they give it says while the oven might deliver the sweet aromas of cookies studded with fruit and nuts the new belgium holiday ale brings all the comforting flavors without having to step into the kitchen so i guess the beer just sits at your couch (laughs) but uh i like my beer in the fridge personally to take it out but okay uh no uh with warm spices like cinnamon and nutmeg bringing the comforting vibes this beer is perfect for snuggling on the couch and watching that favorite holiday movie yeah there's some new belgiums i like um yeah i got my whole start in beer with a holiday beer uh that was the sierra nevada christmas ale and they're always great which are all you know always good but they're really strong for a first time beer person they're very hoppy like super hoppy and i was not a seasoned beer drinker when i first had this and i don't remember quite who told me about it it was probably somebody I don't know. Somebody that knew beer told me about you could you should try the Christmas ale or whatever. I think it's what is that? Is it called Christmas ale? I can't remember what, it's, what the actual name of it is. But it's whatever Sierra Nevada puts out around this time. And so I went to the store and I found it, and I was really excited to find it because I uh, had never because somebody had told specifically told me about it, and I took it home and drank it, and it was you know it's one of those like. It, if you're not an IPA person and then you like drink like a really strong hoppy IPA and you're like, Oh my God, like what is this crap? But you know, I kind of stuck with it and I think that's what actually got me <laughs> to, to be tolerant of IPAs was, was that Christmas sale. Cause I would, get, that, that would, that happened like well before I got into craft beer. So I think that was like my gateway drug into craft beer was that, that Sierra Nevada Christmas sale. I don't think I've had one. Yeah, that's always a good one. Yeah, it's always good. I've never, I haven't had one in years. I used to buy it every year. Yeah, I haven't really had it in years. So I moved on to bigger and better thing. I mean, that that one's kind of, uh, I don't, don't want to say mainstream. I don't know. If I feel so snobby saying it's so mainstream. I, it's like a, it's almost the, one of those that I don't buy anymore because there's a, like I know there's better holiday beers out there. <laughs> Well, it's hard. There's too many yeah. now, and they keep coming up with new ones. And each some there's some of your favorites that like tweak the recipe each year to come up with a new original thing. So it's hard to like keep up. Yeah, and keep everything. And I'm not as big into holiday beers as I am like pumpkin beers. Like the Christmas stuff, I don't go yeah. all out on 
holiday beers typically. No. Although I do like to have at least uh, a couple of Mad Elves. I love uh, Mad Elves. Yeah. Year. I love that one. And I do like something about a nice, like, you sit by a fireplace, you get a nice, warm, thick stout. Yeah, stuff like always that. A but nice, I, you know, one of those winter warmer beers. I don't are go out, good. But, but stouts, you know, I guess I, what I'm saying is I don't necessarily go after, like, the ones that are specifically Christmas based. Like, they have the oh, cinnamon yeah, no. and the nutmeg and all that stuff, like, which is kind of odd. You would think I would, but I think I'm kind of burned out on that after, after pumpkin season. So I typically tend to do like you, I like go towards the stouts and like maybe the more wintry, darker beers, but not necessarily like holiday beer. If you know what I mean? Not necessarily like yeah, cookies no, I, and gingerbread and all that stuff kind of thing. No, you, I don't think you need to, because I think, you know, the holiday, you know, the holidays, we, okay, so the difference with, um, I think, with the pumpkin beers, you're looking for the pumpkin flavor, but for the the winter beer, you know, the Christmas beers, you're almost looking for a whole, like, season, like a warming yes, season exactly, of beers. Yeah. It's not so much one day or, you know, kind of thing. Um, there was something I meant to say in the first chapter. I just remembered it now. Um, there's a series I started watching on the Travel Channel. I watched just the first episode. It's Eli Roth uh, does it. It's it's Urban Legends. Have you yeah, seen that, Tim? Yeah, the first one was really good. It was a, I see the one I saw. I think I missed the first one in order of the way, but the one I the only one I saw so far was with the uh, the, the dress, the prom dress thing. Well, I haven't and, seen um, all of them. I, the, the first one was um, about this online. Uh, it was almost like hostel, but it was like online, and people would pay to watch these killers kill people. Mm. That one was really good. I don't I don't think yeah. I finished the series though because I don't recognize the dress one. Yeah, I have them all uh, on the DVR now. I think, um, but you, you know what I like? It's funny. I went into that series thinking it was like more of a docu style, like you know, like a typical Travel Channel show. I didn't realize it was like a reenactment show. But what I like is at least is that the fact that like the last fifteen minutes is usually Eli Roth talking to the the director and about the actual urban legend kind of thing. So it's kind of like kind of got a mix of the two. Things it's it's definitely worth your time if you um yeah the, you got a chance I don't want to see the other ones yeah the dress one was interesting it was about a girl trying to get a prom dress and um she finds a dress in a secondhand shop and it's you know it's supposedly haunted and um so she goes through some yeah they're all there they're all that. based on urban like popular urban yeah. legends and stuff so yeah yeah that was like I really liked the first segment I need to finish watching those. Yeah, I know. Yeah, same. I have, a, like I said, I got them on the DVR. But if you have the Travel Channel app, you can probably get them all too. Yeah. But um, yeah, so uh, check out, check, keep following our social media for the the smile contest, and and check out Holiday Hell if you got, you know, you're looking for a, a movie. Just like we said, just for, uh, you know, with Jeffrey Combs, you don't want to brush it aside. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, we'll be next. Uh, we'll be next. We'll be back next week with a yes. uh, another Christmas movie. That'll be our last for the year. Uh, yeah, it'll then, be our, our season finale. Yeah, we'll be going on a uh, a little bit of a break as we usually do around this time, so we can revamp and reboot for season seven. Uh, season seven, the first episode back up, I guess, will be our two hundred fiftieth, right? Yeah, so we're starting off with a strong oh, milestone. milestone. Yeah, so uh, look for that sometime in January. We don't have the exact dates yet. Uh, we will have our January dismemberment on time. Yeah, and I think there might be a bonus mini-sode also coming up uh, with an interview coming up. And then we need to reschedule another interview that we were hoping to have this week, but uh, the schedules got crossed, so we might have to move that. Uh, but So you may still get a couple little mini-sodes uh, sprinkled in between now and next week also. And then um, and we will have, you know, of course, the first week of January. We're not going to leave you uh, high and dry there without the dismemberment. We'll have that ready to go. Yeah. Um, but we do like to take the break, you know, spend time with family, you know, catch up, relax. And, you know, it is, you know, it's fun. It's like this year I feel like this was the one of the hardest seasons to do just because – and Cody, don't get scared. It's not like we're, we're burnt out or anything. It's just for some reason, like scheduling just seemed to like – like throw us for loops this year. I don't know. And then we then then like in the fall season, like we, it always does, we get all these interviews yeah. coming up, and it just makes it really, uh, it kind of makes it hard to sometimes fit everything we want to do in. Yeah. So especially when you got but, travel yeah. and everything going on. Yeah, yeah, and it was travel, uh, just different times of stuff. So well, um, 
and you know, like, like, yeah, like this way I went away for like the Thanksgiving break, which we don't usually do. And you know, that kind of throws it off. So yeah, there's, there's just a lot. It just seems like this episode with timing and stuff was just, was so hard. I mean, especially the summer, that summer's vacation that went on forever. <laughs> forever. Uh, we also were, so some, some things about for season seven, we got some ideas. We are looking at changing our logo. Don't panic. But uh, the logo is, I, yeah. Th- when we started that that whole logo, it, we slapped it together because we thought nobody would listen to this podcast. I thought maybe we might get you know five people, and four of them yeah. would be family. <laughs> uh, so that that logo was kind of thrown together. I feel like it's not really the best in this day and age. I don't think it's aged yeah. well because it's got the whole like. Even though I was very careful not to put like actual Confederate symbology on it i don't like the guns on it i don't like the i don't know it, just, it it evokes a certain tone that i didn't mean for it to evoke at the time yeah uh, now based on today's political climate let's say so uh that's not what i had ever intended the logo to be and i, I just and, and we've never had any complaints about it but yeah no we know yeah i guess i think people know us yeah no we've never had any know, complaints that... about it. there's never been any anybody that disliked the logo for any reason but i just to me it just doesn't and you're always your own worst critic i designed that logo i created it i don't feel like it's a professional logo so if you guys uh if any of you out there are graphic designers or do logos or do anything like that definitely hit us up if you think you can help uh we've got some ideas for what we'd like the logo to look like but uh, we are definitely uh, interested in revamping that. I would love to get it in time for season seven. I know with the holidays, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, but, that'd probably be tough. But um, but I, maybe before at least New Jersey Horror Con, that would be that. Maybe that's a more realistic goal. Yeah, with March. yeah. So if we could get it sometime in the first quarter of next year, would be would be awesome. So if you guys uh, do any of that, or you know anybody that does any of that, please uh, send them our way to our Civil War Podcast at gmail dot com. We are definitely uh, interested in talking to some some artists who would be uh, compensated for their time. So. Yeah. And the, be- and the thing is, if you, you know, if you have merchandise with our old logo, that just makes it more valuable That's now. Right. When we, yeah. When we retire that logo, yeah. I think that logo will still be around in some capacity. It'll be like the alternate logo, yeah. the old vintage yeah. style. But um, yeah, but I mean, yeah. And, and once we get that new logo, it'll, you know, we'll instantly feature it in our merch store and put all that in there. So you can have the, yeah, you know, well, and we'll still leave the old one there. It's not like we're going to take it away. Yeah, 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 for sure. It'll still be there. I've still for got those shirts with it. that on it. I'm not, not going. Yeah, I mean, I'm not throwing those shirts away. I love <laughs> those shirts. Yeah, my sweatshirts are the most comfortable sweatshirts ever. I'll just buy three more of the with the new yeah. one. Yeah. All right, guys, we'll see you back here next week. Take care. See ya.